<laughs> What's the story? Hiya. I've been thinking this week about our story uh, as a church in Greystones. Um, and I remember when we moved from Bray uh, and we got this land and we um, built this building. Um, I was a teenager at the time, and as I was reflecting on it this week, I remember being out at the back there, and we were split into teams on a work day, and it was me and Dorothy Scanlon. Those of you uh, who remember Dorothy was such a great part of our church here. And for those of you who don't know Dorothy, she's visually impaired, and we were moving big rocks and filling wheelbarrows and moving things uh, all around outside. And we were a team, and I just remember it being so much fun, me sort of telling her where the wheelbarrow was and her shoveling loads of stuff into it. And she was so strong and fit and more energy than anybody else. Um, but there was also a sense of anticipation at the time of what we were doing. We were preparing a place which was going to be a place where we would uh, gather and have worship. I remember as a youth group come in and uh, the, the, these bricks for these rooms up here had arrived and were all outside and it, SISM was on and so a big group of young people came and we carried all of the bricks, uh, the blocks upstairs that were then uh, put down. We chose the horrible paint for the, <laughs> for the walls of the youth room which stayed for 15 years. <laughs> Sorry about that. that, I was the one who chose those colors. <laughs> um, I remember how at the time and at different points in our history and our story, we had a thriving youth group here and we had, you know, brought more than 20 young people to Denmark and to Germany and to Bulgaria. And we have had a church of, of older people who loved our young people and invested in, in young people. Those of, who have, have gone on to lots of interesting places uh, um, around Ireland, around the world. Um, and I think like if you look at some of the, if we wrote our history, like it, we, they did in the Old Testament, you know, you'd have all of the different names of all of the people who have come through here, uh, not just this building, but through our church family, um, who have been called, some of whom called to ministry and sent to different places. Um, and what it said to me is like, our story is rich as a church. And God's fingerprint is all over it. It's all over the transformation of people's lives. It's all over God's faithful uh, provision over decades. I bumped into David Martin last night. Um, we were both getting uh, uh, some kebabs at the, <laughs> at the Middle Eastern uh, restaurant here in town. And we were talking, and we were just talking about sort of history and, and the story of the church. And we were talking about when the church started here in Ireland and was meeting in Dublin uh, uh, up in, in Gardner Street and talking about the Hogan family and Stevens family and the Stevenson family and all of this is part of our story and you know when we look around like this building this plot of land in Greystones money we have in the bank it didn't come from nothing but it came from decades of faithfulness of the people of God here, but faithfulness of, of, of God over the lives of those who've been part of this fellowship. And it's really important that we look back and we remember and we give thanks for God's faithfulness over the years. Because in doing so, not only does it give us like encouragement in the present, but it gives us a hope for the future because we remember how God has led us up to this point. And this is exactly what's happening in the book of Ezra. They are looking backwards, giving thanks. They are recommitting themselves to God in worship, and they are moving forward in hope. So that's why I started by saying, what's the story? Our story is really important. And our story has, has, has living pillars in it. Fred and Ruth here some of the longest standing pillars, but more pillars will be built and added. And this is our rich story or tapestry as a church. So I'm gonna read from Ezra chapter three, verses one to six, it'll be on the screen. When the seventh month came and the Israelites were in the towns, the people gathered together in Jerusalem. Then Joshua son of Jozadak with his fellow priests 
and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his kin, set out to build the altar of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it, as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundation because they were in dread of the neighboring peoples. They offered burnt offerings upon it to the Lord, morning and evening. And they kept the festival of booths. Another word for that is the Feast of Tabernacles, as prescribed, and offered the daily burnt offerings by, <clears throat> by number according to the ordinance, as required for each day. And after that, the, the regular burnt offerings and the offerings at the new moon and at all the sacred festivals of the Lord and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from the King Cyrus of Persia. So we've been talking uh, so far in this story of, um, of Ezra, of return and rebuild. Um, and the Israelites who were in captivity in Babylon have been released. With, with the approval and the goodwill of, of King Cyrus, he has given them back the plunder that was stolen from the, the, the people of Israel and they are sent backwards to Jerusalem with the intention to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple. So they've been in exile um, for 70 years, some of whom had, who had been taken to exile and returned were, were alive when, when they were taken into exile. Um, and they returned to the city that was destroyed um, and they are about to rebuild it. And so they've, <clears throat> where we're up to in the story of Israel is that, uh, story of Ezra is that they have returned and they are now in this place, the city which has basically had been laid to waste with the task of rebuilding it. But in the, in the calendar year, we're told that it was now the Feast of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. Now this is a Jewish festival. It's talked about in Leviticus. It's talked about in the book of Numbers. Um, but it's where the Jewish people erected like tents or booths that they would live in for the week um, of the festival. Um, it's called uh, in Hebrew Sukkot. And maybe if, uh, if you go, so when we used to live in Jerusalem, we would go there and you would see that every Jewish family would build a booth in their house, a sukkah in their garden. Would be on the, if in the city, would maybe on their balcony in their apartment or in the garden at the back. But the point was for the week of the festival, people would actually live in a booth or a tent. And the idea was that they would remember the time that the Israelites were in the wilderness. So when Moses and God had brought them out of Egypt, they wandered in the desert for 40 years in the wilderness. And this, like spending time in these booths was a way of remembering the simplicity, the complete reliance on God. Um, but they, it was like a, a dramatic reenactment of their own story. It's a really cool festival and brilliant for kids because they you know, will sleep in, in the booth and, and eat their meals in the booth and read scripture in the booth and, and do all of these things in their little tents. And so it's this festival that's going on when the people of Israel have returned to Jerusalem. And it's probably especially evocative one for them because they've just been living in another exile, in another captivity. Now they've returned. They were probably staying in tents along the way and maybe even Jerusalem right now, they're living in tents because they have to but they're celebrating God's faithfulness and God's um, uh, the tabernacling with them. Um, it would have been a really special um, feast of tabernacles or festival of booths. Um, and so they tell the story. But the first thing that they do when they've got all of these tasks ahead of them, all of these dreams, all of these intentions to build the temple, they've brought all of this, these resources with them. The first thing they do is they build an altar and they worship. They don't erect the walls. They don't start planting crops. They don't start doing all of these different things. But they find where the altar is supposed to be, where the altar used to be in the old temple before it was destroyed, and they reconstruct the altar there and they worship God. The altar was used for, for physical sacrifices, of course, um, back in those times, 
The altar was the place where in Exodus God had promised to meet with the people of God and to cleanse sin. But on their return, on their, their dream of this new future in Jerusalem, the first port of call was worship. And they do that through reenacting the story um, of the wilderness, through living in these uh, sukkah, through, um, uh, uh, through sacrifice and burnt offerings. And the reason is that worship is the heartbeat of the people of God. Worship is the core of their identity. Confession, like we did today, sacrifice, reading of scripture, retelling of God's deeds throughout history, it shapes them as a people, as it shapes us. It's a time of looking back for the people of Israel, but also a time of looking forward. They're sitting in a city full of ruins. It needs to be rebuilt. They need to plan and mobilize and, and get things ready. But first things first, they build an altar and they worship Yahweh. As part of our series on Ezra, we're reflecting on the idea of exile and our own sort of mini exile of having been locked in our homes throughout COVID, um, our inability to meet together, to be together properly. And we're beginning to come out of that now um, and so there's, there's just lots of um, sort of echoes of, of these stories of, of returning. Um, but there's another layer in here because as a church leadership, the church board and, and others are looking at what are we going to do with our building here? And what are we doing with the future of the church? How do we make this building into something better that will, uh, to better serve the local community? A place of welcome, of nurture, of support, of hospitality. These are the discussions that are going on with the church board, and, and there's excitement about what's possible. But first, we worship. Because this is the heartbeat of the church. Not the building. Although the building, I personally am excited about doing something different. I think it will be really good for us, and I think we'll be, we have the possibility to do something uh, really special. But it's not the building where we find connection with God. It's through worship. That's the heartbeat. The story of Ezra reminds us to look back at the stories of which we are a part. And we're a part of this biblical story, this story of God's faithfulness to the people of Israel in the wilderness, their release from captivity. It's not just their story. That's actually our story now as well, because we have been grafted in as Paul, to use the language that Paul would, this, we, we join them. This is our story of what God has done in history. And so we're part of the biblical story. We're also part of the story of this local church in Greystones. This is our story. And it's not yet finished. And we have our own personal stories too, each of us, of our own returning from exile, our personal times in the wilderness, our own stories of rescue, and redemption. It's important that we look back and we remember these and we give thanks for them because those things give us hope now and hope for the future. I wish we could take communion today. I'm not sure when we can start taking uh, communion again because in our own Christian tradition, that is our own dramatic reenactment of the story because we physically eat bread and wine and we tell the story of God's redeeming work in the world through a broken body and a life poured out. Hopefully we'll be having communion together soon. But in closing, I wanna return back to the Feast of, of Tabernacles because it's mentioned once in the Gospels, um, this feast. Um, it's mentioned in John's Gospel and Jesus, is in, Jesus goes to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. I feel like every time I've spoken the last few weeks, I've gotten one of the big Jewish festivals, like <laughs> whether it's Passover or Pentecost. Um, but there were three big pilgrimage festivals, and the Feast of Tabernacles was the third one. Um, and there were lots of rituals that would go on during that week, um, during the feast. But one of them, which is really interesting, was the water libation which is where they would go down to the pool of Siloam, the priests, 
and they would take water from the pool of Siloam and they would bring it up to the temple, up the hill to the temple, up the steps, and they would pour it on the altar. And it was a way of giving an offering and praying for good rains that would provide food and, uh, and all that was needed for the people of Israel. But it was a very important part of the Feast of Tabernacles was the water libation. But in the book of John, chapter 7, we read, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. As we talk about a lot with the Old Testament, everything is building and building, and it's building towards Jesus, who is the fulfillment of so much of the promise in the Old Testament. And this water that would have been poured on the altar in hope and anticipation, Jesus says, come to me and drink and be filled with living water. And that invitation is still there for whoever is thirsty, come and drink. So as we continue to return and rebuild, as we, as we emerge out of COVID-19, our, our mini exile, let us remember our first port of call, like Ezra and the others. We worship. We worship together. And as we think about the future and all of its possibilities, let's remember the story of God of which we're all a part, the story that comes before us. And as they sing, they actually sing later on in Ezra chapter 3, when they lay the foundation of the temple, everyone is singing in praise, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Should we stand together and sing about building on this foundation of Jesus Christ? Uh, and I'm, I think we've done this one before, so it may be new, but um, its message is helpful for us this morning. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of every praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. In Jesus, the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.